I'm Bill Patton with USA Tennis Coach, and I on the show today, I'm really happy to have Margot Carter, who's also going to be presenting at the FHSTA workshop coming up this weekend, and you can come to that, And but what we're going to do right now is give you a little teaser as to what Margot's presentation is going to be about. So, uh, Margo, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background and what are you currently doing and, and how did you kind of get into this topic as a specialty? Ooh, okay, yes. So, hi, I'm Margo. Uh, I do have a funny accent, it is not Australian. Uh, I grew up in the south of England, uh, but my family is half French, half English, so I sort of spent a lot of time around uh, those two countries and I came over to the USA in 2003 on a tennis scholarship. Uh, I did my four years at Tennessee Tech University uh, and went on the pro tour for a couple of years which uh, was really a fantastic time. Uh, I made it to 451 in the world at one point in doubles, uh, ran out of money as you do, um, went back to school, got a master's in environmental biology that I am subsequently not using um, and then ended up tennis coaching because the world of tennis kept saying come back come back and I realized just how much I love this sport that's uh, great. after uh, a few years of country club tennis I my visa over here expired and so I went back to Europe and I didn't have anything to do so I thought hey let's go and play some more tennis uh so I went back on the the tour that summer and got to I think it was like 850 or something in like four mm. months which was so much fun um and uh I ruptured my Achilles tendon, which is a little bit of a bummer, but um, then I started my own business. Uh, so I've been operating as uh, under Spherical Yellow, which is my company name, since 2015, um, and just building tennis programming in Nashville, primarily, and uh, through the website and through Instagram as well, a lot. Um, but really, it's, it's a, a little bit of everything. And I'm having a lot of fun because I'm learning business the hard way, which is really the best way, I think, to learn something, really. Awesome. Awesome. So here, I'm going to make myself large for a second. Okay, now, so it's funny. I am I feel so blessed because I'm actually using my major. But now, it's funny. I never realized it, that you are spherical yellow. So I've seen your stuff around and, yes. and have for a period of time. And now... So, look, but let's get right into it. You know, not a lot of, you know, let's go right into, because what we're going to do in this talk is we're going to talk a little bit about the background of the development of the topic for you. And then we want to get really practical. We want to have, you know, two or three or maybe a couple more takeaways that are really practical things that people can do to uh, communicate better with their players. And, you know, and if we can break it down into some of the generalities of, dealing with boys and girls differently, especially for a male coach with each and a female coach with each, because there are some issues there that we can overcome and, and make things better. Now let's see if I can get this back here and make you big again. I did it, but now I have to do this. Ah, right, very good. So, <laughs> and Margo's make faces, so this is good. It's good you're on camera. Because you make faces, so this is good. All right. I feel like it's really awkward if I'm just sitting here not doing anything with my face, so I'm gonna pull. No, I like to I, thank you for not emoting. I that's a really awesome. Oh, good. No, there it is. This is that's okay. So, if you're listening to this as a podcast, you're gonna want to check the video out somewhere, <laughs> it'll be on YouTube, and you can look at Margot's faces. All right. So what's the um what's the where, what's the background of you getting into this? My topic, um, yeah. well, it's it's been a long time evolving, um, and and I think that you just you learn from experience over time what I like, what I don't like, how people communicate with me, uh, what I appreciate, what I don't appreciate, and then and then you start to look at how these things affect your players and I've really learned that if you're if you're very attentive and very good at observing what you say and how it affects your players you can really fine-tune that to become the best coach that you can be because there's no question out there that 
so many of us know our stuff really well. But if we can't communicate that to ways that everyone can understand, then we're not really a good coach, actually. If you can know your stuff and not be able to explain it, then you're not actually a good coach. You're just knowledgeable. And I think that being able to communicate what you know to people is, is so important. But then what becomes even more essential is that everyone we work with is different. Everyone listens differently. Everyone learns differently. Everyone has different past experiences. And so by observing our methods of communication and how they affect people, we can actually fine tune everything we do for each person to become more effective. And you can then help them to learn and understand more quickly. So that's great. Okay. I want to throw a story in there because you, because, okay. you know, because I, I get to talk a little because I can't go a whole show without talking. But you know, anyway, okay. I want to throw something at you and then. I want you to analyze it, all right, for me. And, you know, or, in you know, so, okay. So I was coaching a team that I was pretty new to. And as is always true in the early goings, tough because they're not used to me. And, and I do things pretty radically different than everybody. So they're just, everybody's in flux. It's a lot of change and it's difficult. So I know that. They don't, they don't know that. I know that, but you know, it's, it's going to be difficult and it's going to be gif difficult for a month. So, so I come in and practice is just starting. And one of my players comes in a little bit late and, and you know, I'm, I'm going, I'm working with her and all of a sudden she gives me the stink eye. Right. And I was like, Oh my goodness. And so I stopped and I looked and I was like, wow. I mean, that was, something we have an issue here right so I, so I pulled her aside and i said hey do we have a problem right do we do we do you and i have a problem here and and she and and, and she, you know so i got her away from the other girls you know and very quietly did this and then and then she said no no we don't have a problem and then, but she, her, she didn't immediately her, she didn't immediately like perk up and become all of a sudden super happy person, right? But then by the next day, I saw a completely different attitude from her. Mm -hmm. So analyze that. That's interesting, because all you did was ask. Mm -hmm. And you didn't get a logical answer, but you did see a change. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes just simply asking someone for their opinion rather than telling them what to do. And you gave her an opportunity in a quiet space to say something. And she may have thought, I'm not ready to say anything. Maybe, maybe it was something that really didn't need to be voiced, but it was something that underneath just being given the opportunity to say something, not in front of the others. And then go, actually, I don't need to say it. I just need to let it go. We're all good the next day. Um, but it needed to be even just the opportunity to air, even if you don't use it, can make a difference, I think. Yeah, I think you nailed it. And she later told me that, that she'd just really been having a really hard day. Yeah. You know, and that, that while, you know, so I, it was really easy to yeah. interpret it that I had done something wrong, yeah. I, you know, we there was like well, she didn't like me or you know yeah okay but just by asking the question and giving her the opportunity maybe she thought okay yeah i had a bad day i'm not about to tell my new tennis coach about my bad day but clearly i need to change my attitude mm. like being asked the question makes you ask those questions internally yeah all right so now so this is this in case anybody couldn't tell we have no script today <laughs> <laughs> or flying off the cuff. All right. So what, so what, where do, what's kind of the first building block of developing this ability to observe, you know, because, because, you know, what I was trying to show there was that I was that I was doing that observing, you know, so what, so from, you know, being observational and then what's the next step, you know, towards building your ability to communicate with players. 
Um, well, I think that obviously observation actually needs to go underneath or is at the core of everything when it comes to what I have called the communication code or my own uh, little methods for talking to people. Observation is before anything. I'm going to observe and see what I can come up with. I believe that the power of observation and taking the time to observe is powerful for a number of different things. Um, you can really come up with conclusions that you can say to people and then they will sort of think, well, actually, I saw my coach watching me for this extended period of time. And, and now they're giving me some observations. Therefore, it must be true. Now, this can be a little bit cheeky because maybe it's not always 100 percent true. But you can use that to your advantage when you're helping someone to develop as a player. And, and they can really think, oh, the coach was watching and here's an observation. So, so observation, I think, needs to be underneath everything here. But then my next real main point for this is positivity. And I could honestly talk for a while on positivity alone, but I believe that absolutely everything we say can be phrased in a positive manner. Um, I believe that we should focus on solutions rather than problems. Uh, if you immediately sh say to someone what's wrong, you're actually not helping them, really. Especially if you're trying to coach someone, you're trying to make them become a better player or, or honestly better at anything in life. Um, so, but instead, if you sit back and you watch, okay, observ observation again, you can take a minute to watch everything that's going wrong and right and then best figure out how to help them because you don't want to overload them with information as well. So number one, everything can be phrased positively, but secondly, you can choose the best, most positive thing to help them without giving them 10 things to think about. Um, and again, that, that stems from having spent some time watching them and then thinking about your phraseology. I, I feel like so often, especially players, younger players, they'll say, they'll say to themselves, oh, stop hitting it out or stop hitting it in the net. Well, that means that your brain is thinking about things going out and things going in the net. Those are not solutions to your problems. Mm -hmm. um, so we can train people to think in a form that is solutions as well as coach in solutions. So positivity for me is, is a key thing. And that doesn't mean rah, rah, let's be a cheerleader. Yeah. Um, it just means that we can always rethink everything we say to become a positive phrase. Okay, let me let me kind of tweak that a little bit. All right, so um, there I'm. Oh wait, uh, I'm I'm not so good at this Zoom thing, but uh, all right. So I'm a big fan of objectivity as opposed to negativity or positivity. Um, okay. In, and, the, and the reason being that I think sometimes, like you said, it can be come across too rah-rah and sort of disconnected yeah. from reality. I'm a really big into here's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Here's what is happening. You know, it's not my feelings about what are, what's happening. It's, it's what, can, can we understand it? Um, mm -hmm. And one thing I notice is that my players presume that when I'm watching them, that I'm criticizing them in my head. Right. And so, and so when, when I talk to them, I, I don't say, I don't try to put a positive spin on what I saw, but I assure them that I'm not criticizing them. Okay. So perhaps I said the word positive too many times. And perhaps I should have used the word solutions more often. Okay. No, I think that's good. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what I believe is the solution to your problem. We're not going to focus on the problem. We're going to focus on the solution, whether that's your weight transfer or your follow through or, or your contact point or your preparation. We're going to focus on the thing that's going to help you. We're not going to focus on what's not working. What to do. Yes, and that's kind of underneath it all, that's the big thing for me that is positive as opposed to 
negative but if you prefer solutions to be more what we focus on then i think that that works there's an interesting little bit of research that that pointed to when um when coaches give sort of these this hey good job nice shot blah 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 you know sort of meaningless effort related uh coaching that mm -hmm. kids translate to that to mean you're not good but when but when coaches give specific competencies to achieve that the underlying message is that they believe you're capable of doing it because so good try margo is not mm -hmm. as good as hey margo i want you to do i want you to put a little more topspin on your forehand oh yeah absolutely but i also think that sometimes i completely agree with you by the way but i also think that sometimes people uh, within themselves are so keen on seeing the ball go over and in that they cannot see the small progress they've made um, The ball may have hit the back fence But if you did what I asked you to do and you made that good adjustment I'm gonna mm -hmm. say I don't care where the ball goes for the next five minutes I just want you to think about this one adjustment and you have to remind them because they really want to see that ball go over and in Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Let's just work on this one thing. Um, but at least then it's quite specific. You know, they can really think, okay, I'm making progress on this one thing. I'm going to trust trust my coach. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and building that trust. Okay. So now, so building that trust is essential. Yes. So, what are the what are the issues of building trust or not? Oh. Well, it is tricky because, um, well, I, I know it can be tricky because I also have some pretty unorthodox methods sometimes. And so I usually lead at the very beginning, especially with a new client, I lead into something with, you are probably going to think I'm crazy some days. And that's okay. Um, you're you're going to wonder why I'm doing something or what I'm doing. And I want, I always say to people, I want you to ask me. If it doesn't make sense, stop me and say, Margo, this doesn't make sense. Because if it doesn't, then I'm not communicating effectively. And my goal here is to be an effective communicator where we're both on the same page. And so I always start out with that, with new people. Obviously, my established players, they, they're used to it by now. Um, but I think that helps because when it comes to establishing trust, if you tell people that you want them to question you, then they're going to be a lot more comfortable questioning you. And also they're going to feel like, well, she's really confident with what she's doing because she doesn't mind if I tell her I think she's wrong. That is awesome. And, you know, I, one of my favorite moments when I'm meeting a new group of kids, and I'm, I'm now doing a Facebook Live mid-interview here. But anyway, um, one of my favorite moments when I meet new kids is that moment when a kid has some – has a moment of dissent, you know, they're against me or they have a tough question and they think it's going to be a stumper. And then the rest of the group kind of gets this look on their face like, uh-oh, uh-oh. I mean, because because it's either it's this way or that way. This could be bad. And when you win that moment, then then you win a lot of the team over. Yeah. So, but I, I, you know, I've always enjoyed those moments where, where, you know, kids says something and they think they're going to get in trouble and you go, you know, that's a really good point. Let's talk yeah. about that. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Yeah. This seems contradictory to what I'm teaching, but what it really shows is that you don't really fully understand what it is I'm teaching. <laughs> or, on the other hand, sometimes it shows that people are thinking about it far more than you even realize. Yes which is right. really so, great too. I always love those questions. Well, and that's, that's another good point too, is that pretty much all thinking, especially from teenagers, should in some way be acknowledged. And unfortunately though, sometimes there are such things as stupid questions because they have nothing to do with anything, right? Or they're easily, or they're easily answered by themselves. So I sometimes have to ask, how long did you think about that question? Mm -hmm. right, okay, but anyway, let's let's keep going. So we're building the trust. What are some other issues that kind of come up? 
in well it's <laughs> it's interesting that we got to asking questions already because i was going to get to that later on okay but, um in the meantime i think that something else that's incredibly important is the ability to adapt your language um i think too often we get stuck saying the same phrases and the same words over and over again and i think being able to see that someone isn't quite understanding it. I mean, sometimes people aren't very aware of their bodies and you can ask them to drop the racket head and they drop their whole body and various <laughs> things. Uh, and, and to be able to, to look at them and see how your language is being interpreted and whether it worked or it didn't and to then adapt and come up with a different way of explaining it, I think is very important. Um, mm -hmm. And so being able to rephrase things is huge. Uh, but another thing I really love is analogies as well. And so, and that involves again, uh, questioning people maybe on, I, I always like to find out a little bit about people, um, especially new people, obviously once, once you've got an established client uh, player, everything gets a little bit different because they get to know you, but with the new people, especially, um, find out a little bit more about them and come up with some analogies that they can really relate to to help them understand what it is you're trying to say and I have a lot of fun with this because I, I think my brain works like a little differently than everyone else's so I can come up with some really bizarre analogies but when you see that look on people's faces of clarity suddenly it's great it's such a great feeling mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just so important for us as coaches to, to adapt. I have an, ex an example for you. So I had this girl and she's very artsy and, and logic was not a big part of her MO. And I was trying to teach her how to, you know, go, go low to high, kind of have a looping, a looping stroke, you know, and, and go low to high and hit some top spin, brushing up on the back of the ball. And she said, it's like spreading frosting on cupcakes. And I went, and I <laughs> like, and my brain went kablooey for a second. Yeah. Like, yeah, very large frost, very large cupcakes. Okay. okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna spread some frosting on cupcakes. All right. Yeah. And that yeah. worked for her. I mean, so that's one of the more bizarre ones. So. Oh gosh, no. And this is something that I'm gonna open up to the floor um, on Saturday because I want to hear people's strangest analogies because I love it. I mean, I've got a really funny one for volleys where you imagine that there's a horse at the end of your racket pulling you. Like, and th I've got this one lady that now every time she volleys, she thinks of being pulled by a horse. She just, it works for her. Okay. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm actually gonna be interviewing one of the, one of the, cutting edge visualization people who started introducing this in the 60s and was thought to be a kook you know oh, really? yeah 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 you know because those who were seen dancing were thought mad by those who could not hear the music <laughs> that's a good so, one that's uh Nietzsche. anyway so now what's what's the next stage here what's uh now so is there have we gotten to the point where we can say we have a practical so a practical thing for people to do? Well, my third main point is, is going back to what we started talking about a few minutes ago, which is uh, asking questions. Okay. Um, and I think that we as tennis coaches have a tendency to preach and tell people, this is what, this is what you need to do, whatever it is. We've already talked about how you tell people, how you talk to people, how you adapt your language. Um, but something else that's a little different is to simply ask people, uh, what happened here? Why did that happen? And very often, because they've been listening to you, they'll sort of throw out one or two things. Okay, so why, what, what happened there? Why, why'd that ball go up and out? Uh, my racket face was open, yes, but why? Uh, I was too close to the ball, yes, but why? Uh, I was out of position. Yes. So what's the solution? Oh, earlier preparation and footwork. Bam. Good job. Let's work on that. So then once you've gone through that, the person suddenly realizes that they have the power to fix their own problems. 
Um, they don't always, need, which they need to figure out because in a match, you don't have someone telling you every time what's going on. But wait a minute, Margo. The, I, I, the coach, don't really derive a lot of ego satisfaction, nor can I keep people on the hook for that weekly private lesson if I set them free to do their own thinking. Well, that's a fair point, but... No, I'm, you, uh, wait, I was being facetious. You thought I was being sincere? I think there are people that would totally think what you just said for <laughs> real. I get that you don't, but there are people that would think that. Right. I, there absolutely are. So, yeah, yeah. you know, what, what's the solution for that person? Um, they, they need to understand that they are helping their players to become better, and by helping their players to find internal solutions is great. But if they're a good, if they're a good coach that can help them grow and evolve as they get better, they're going to find more and more things that, that can be worked on, whether it's strategy or different stroke development or whatever. I don't think by asking a few questions, they're going to be set free forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. No, and you know, it's funny. I mean, it's really amazing to me uh, to meet someone who also coaches like this because I'm constantly asking questions and the kids, when the kids come for their first lesson with me, private lesson, they can't believe that thinking is required. <laughs> and, and the other fun, funny thing, and I know you've seen this is you ask that question, you ask them a question and then, and then they go, they go, what? They go, why? I'm like, no, no, no. I'm asking you the question. My yeah. question was not rhetorical as a preamble to me giving you the answer. Mm -hmm. It was an actual question. Yep. They try to worm their way out of having to think. Yeah. Oh, I've got a really funny story. Can I share a funny story? Go. Um, I was teaching this kid. Uh, I've been teaching him for a while, actually. He's a pretty high-level junior player. Um, he's 16 now, so this was, what, a year or two ago? And he played a tournament, and he had played the best tennis he played in a long time. But he also happened to have a really bad cold and had been on ibuprofen or something all weekend. And he came up to me and said, I played the best tennis so I couldn't believe it. I was so sick. I was expecting to do so badly, but I played the best tennis. And anyway, we had our lesson, carried on. And at the end, I said, I want you to think about the fact that you've played your best tennis. And I want you to try to come up. You know, so I said, you've got a week to think about this. I want you to come back to me next week. And I want you to see if you can figure out why you think it is that even though you were unwell and you were on ibuprofen, you still played the best tennis. And he looked at me with a quizzical look and said, okay. Anyway, of course, I'd totally forgotten I'd asked him this question the following week. And at the very end of the lesson, he stopped me and said, oh, oh, I forgot. I meant to tell you, I Googled the, the ibuprofen and winning tennis matches so many different ways, and I couldn't come up with an answer. <laughs> Oh my goodness and i said okay so after wow. google, I, I think i laughed no too, but oh. after google failed to give you an answer um did you sit down and think about it you know and he said yeah i don't know so <laughs> i then had to do the why thing and i said okay mm. so you were feeling unwell yes you really had low expectations yes uh, you therefore were not putting any pressure on yourself, correct? He's like, yes. I'm like, so you went out there with nothing to lose. You were relaxed and you played your best tennis because you were relaxed and you had low expectations. And he was like, oh, okay. And I, I, don't, I don't think it quite connected. So then I had to tell him a story. And actually, honestly, most of my best results as a player came from when I was either injured or fresh off the vacation. Because you lower your own expectations, you relax and you play better. So I was trying to teach him that lesson, but it was the, the Google ibuprofen thing that just, oh, it, I'm not going to forget that story in a hurry. Yeah, yeah. No, and I think this will, 
you, this will go really well with uh, with Sterling Strother's stuff because he and I both talk a lot about playing, play, play the game, right? Mm-hmm. And playing is not a high pressure situation, right? Um, com- you know, competing and trying to win and assigning too much meaning to the winning and the losing that is a pressure situation yep so all right so now um are we getting near the end what do you think how much more do we have here uh yeah i mean i guess my my concluding thoughts to oh wait no don't conclude yet hold on oh uh, yeah it's still my show getting near the end. It's, That's what uh, no. well near how near is near i didn't put a time limit on all right so now let's do this let's before we conclude let's get into action items so so what are would be like the top three action items for a coach that really wants to communicate well with their players to help facilitate learning and, and performance observe okay observe and then speak in solutions okay observe and adapt Observe and ask questions. Oh, there was a lot of observing there. Yeah, I think it's very yeah. important. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, this is terrific. I, I really appreciate this. Okay, so now, um, now as we conclude, any final thoughts? Um, well, I mean, that was kind of the summary. I guess if you had to narrow it down to to two two words i'd say adaptable positivity because i know you prefer solutions but i like positivity fine but no i think there's something here okay now something is a little bit under the under the surface here because there's something that holds this all together Mm -hmm. right there's something about the coach and their relationship with the player that uh, motivates them to do all these things. What is, yeah. that, what is that something that motivates a coach to observe and to um, present, present solutions and, and then observe and ask questions? I love this question, actually. This is perfect because um, I was... Uh, speeding up my conclusion but actually the my conclusion perfectly answers your question um i think you know one of the beauties of coaching is that moment when people really understand something they really learn it really clicks that moment for me very often i'm happier than the player because i'm like yes you finally got it that was a beautiful forehand and and i think it's so easy for a coach to sit back and go Actually, you're just not very athletic. You're not getting it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But actually, it's actually up to us to adjust our communication to help that person succeed. Problem solving, this process of problem solving for me is so fun. And actually, really, at the end of the day, we are doing an awful lot of problem solving to help all these individuals become good tennis players. So if you enjoy problem solving, then my code is going to help you do that. Awesome. And I think also, I think it's love. I think it's yeah. because we, we love those people. Yeah, that's true. That helps a lot too. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, hey, uh, so everybody run on out, you know, go straight to the internet and look, look in the notes for the event bright things so you can meet Margo in person and ask her your special question and 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 then you can be there when i get presented with the with the winning beer thing because it's the contest of who came from the farthest named bill Patton who wins a beer from mike baugh (laughs) you can be there part of that ceremony right so anyway so Get ready to meet Margot Carter in Daytona Beach this weekend, and then you can also get in contact with her in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. That's correct. So, do you want to share? Can you share a little contact info so people can reach you and and get in touch with you for some coaching? 
Yeah, yeah. So um, my website is, I thought this was a great name, um, Spherical Yellow, uh, because tennis balls are spherical and they're yellow. But that is S-P-H-E-R-I-C-A-L, yellow.com. Because awesome. um, that's how you spell it. Um, uh, everyone <laughs> seems to get a typo in there and then they can't find me. But it was a really good idea. Yes. Uh, I thought until I realized that. But that's my website and Spherical Yellow on Instagram as well. And um, everything's that. All right. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I look forward to meeting you uh, this weekend coming up. Yeah. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye.